Welcome to another episode of Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides, and with me, as always, is Mr. Chris Elstrom. How are you today, Chris? I'm doing all right. I'm a little bit burned out. I've been busy, thankfully enough, uh, the last couple of weeks here, but I'm good. I'm a little disappointed because you were a little bit pitchy on that intro there. It was pretty low for you to control, I think. So I was, you know what? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the correct answer. <laughs> yeah, podcast intro doesn't matter. That's right? right. Why did you even bring it up? Now I got to edit that out. All right. No, you don't. No, you don't. It's it's all good. Yeah. No, that's very apropos because that's what we're talking about today, right? Bass of some sort, not bass yeah, vocals, not, but just bass. Yeah, not pitchy singers because that singers. you are definitely not a pitchy singer most of the time, anyway. Yeah, indeed. Low end bass EQ frequencies to pay attention to. Say right? that ten times fast. Yeah, I can barely say it once, so I'm just going to stick to that. All right. What are we kicking off with here? Well, the obvious thing here is ding, ding, ding. It's very, very content dependent. Now, drink, what we're about to drink. talk about today, that the frequency ranges here will be very dependent on what type of bass track you're dealing with. Obviously. Obviously. If you. Yeah, if you got a, let's say that you got like a classic rock track when you got eighth notes pounding away in the low end uh, versus a more melodic part that's played higher up, that this, you're dealing with a different set of rules essentially or parts of the spectrum that you're going to need to work with. So, damn right. I would say, you know, think about, you know, under pressure mm -hmm. from John Deacon. No, right? you, you mean vanilla ice. Obviously, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if, you, if you're dealing with a part like that or if you're dealing like a modern metal track, you're dealing with that differently, presumably, yes. and not just from a sonic standpoint, but very differently from a EQ standpoint, or at least I would. So. Sure. Yeah. Let's jump right into this sonic juiciness. What are you starting with? I'm thinking that I might go with a little bit of a low cut, not very high here because we need to be careful. So I might not even go any higher than like 30 mm -hmm. type of a thing because there's so much stuff that still lives down there. And then we wonder why there's no weight in our tracks, right? What about you? I mean, I, I this is also like for bass, it's one of those things that's only when needed really for me. Yeah, I don't so, do a lot of high pass filtering on the bass. And it also is dependent upon what console I'm using at the time, yeah. or the EQ for that matter. Some will start at 30, some will be 31. It's usually right around that 30-ish mark right. for their high-pass filtering kind of thing. But that's assuming, of course, that we're dealing with console-style plug-in, right? But if you're just dealing with a regular type of EQ... Uh -huh. It can behoove you to probably get away with just a little bit of that super, super low end, like below 30, because it can just be some noise in there. And we have to be careful also because we're dealing with space where the kick also lives, right? So, But, but we'll discuss that a little bit later on, I guess. Right. But, well, but yeah. the way I'm thinking about this is if I've got a direct input on a bass, uh, and we're talking uh, electric bass today. Right. Comparatively to a mic bass, the mic is where you might have more issues with a low end rumble or something going on where you might need to high pass filter it. Generally, with a DI bass, you don't need to. Very Unless you true. got really noisy fingers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Noisy finger noise at like 40 cycles, right? That, that would be pretty crazy. But yeah, you're right. It's usually with that, but also let's say that you're you're running that DI, but you've you've printed it through an amp sim, perhaps, right? So go ballsy, might... man! Mic that damn thing up. I've done it. Of course, yeah. <laughs> but you know, then but then we get uh, all the flexibility and stuff as well, right? From the, all the, the amp sims that we could use. Well, and another reason for being careful around high pass filtering at this point because the sub areas are talking zero to 80 ish in that range when you're down there that low what you might be messing with is your general intestinal rattling that you might want in your track 
That's true. That's we, we were trying to come up with good descriptions for this, <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is very much the, the sort of intestinal, like, oh, I feel something that what is that? That's <laughs> going to that. cause me to have a movement, <laughs> right? Yeah, D- didn't the uh, I think uh, the MythBusters did that, and they just said, no, it's absolutely a myth that it doesn't work that way. Sure. Um, so, but anyway, it's still a good description, damn it. So that that's where that lives. And it's like, ooh, that's got some weight behind it, right? Yeah. But if we move up just a little bit in the range here, that's when we're really getting into the fundamentals of pitch, right, for the bass lines. Mm-hmm. So this is something that we need to consider. I know you and I have spoken about it before, and I, I believe we talked about it on the podcast as well, where – we might sit with a mix and we go, okay, well, I need more bass. So you end up reaching for like an EQ, right? Mm-hmm. But it's like, well, maybe you just need to push out the fader a little bit because we, we can make things, or I think anyway, we can make things sound a little bit more unnatural if we start boosting too much in this range. Sure. Right. Yeah. Well, and the big range to really be careful with down here, and we're moving up a little bit beyond the sub range here and getting into the low end is – especially in the 90 to about 110 range. And in that range, you need to be kind of careful because that's where it's a little mushy between the bass and the kick. And yeah. this isn't the same kind of mush as the mud that we'll talk about a little bit later, but this is kind of like just a gooey area of bass and kick. And what you don't want to be doing is doing a whole lot of boosting here. And the only time that I could figure you're doing that is if you've got a really crappy low end original situation where it's almost non-existent and then you have to try and EQ the living bejesus out of it to get something back in there. But yeah, that area between 90 to about 110 is just, it's not a good spot to be doing a lot of boosting. Right. And also one thing that we need to keep in mind when we're doing this is if we think about the frequency versus pitch, right? Just right. as a reference, right? If you're playing an open E string on a bass, that is just about 82 cycles Mm -hmm. at 82 hertz where where that fundamental lives, right? Mm -hmm. So if we keep that in mind, that that's the sort of like the frequency range where there is tonal quality happening. And of course, even lower if we're detuning or if we're using like a five string bass or something, we go down lower than that, obviously. Sure. We don't want to be too aggressive with cutting here, but the area that you're mentioning where we can potentially come into the first harmonic of the fundamental, we it can perhaps get a little bit messy, like you yes, said, if we're can. trying to, to uh, boost stuff right there. If we keep moving up here more, if we keep going into that sort of first harmonic range, that E that I mentioned right now, we're, mm-hmm. we're around 164 hertz. What do you tend to do in this range? Where do you... What do you stand? Do you tend to do some cutting? Do you tend to leave it alone? What do you do? Obviously, it's whatever it needs, right? But It is whatever it needs. However, I will tend to leave it alone for the most part, unless some particular note in this range is jumping out drastically and I need to maybe use a dynamic EQ that's narrowed in on the particular note that's jumping out. However, that being said, in this area of about 120-ish or so, this is where it gets up above your intestinal and it starts getting into the gut sensation of like i'm really feeling this bass at this point so yeah i'm gonna pay attention to that if i really want the bass to feel like it's almost like a punch not so much a intestinal thing but more of like the the gut and the beyond above the gut and the chesty kind of thing we're, we're moving into the solar plexus, the solar chest plexus area, area. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. So again, something obviously to keep or to be aware of because we're dealing with the weight of the base here, right? And how mm-hmm. it can carry through. Now, depending on the part that the base is doing, of course, something that I think we've all noticed is like during a performance, depending on whatever is going on else with other instrumentations and stuff, certain notes can really leap out of, at us at certain frequency ranges. Let's say that we go yep. up from, well, we're moving up from the A to the G and up to a A, B flat, whatever, right? There might be a note that is just sticking out there. And then I think it can be a cool tool to either just with volume automation, but perhaps like you mentioned with 
a dynamic EQ or something like split EQ or something that that can possibly do a good job right. kind of taming those. Well, and the other thing too, on the general overall sense of the bass sound, the electric bass sound, the 180-ish, 250-ish range can kind of be considered the meat of this particular instrument, which is mm. different from the meat of like the guitar and the vocals. This can get in the way. Yeah. And if it's not in the way, great. If it is in the way, obviously you want to cut it. If you feel like you need a little bit more vibe in that area, then you want to use a really wide cue and maybe only boost it no more than one or two dB. Anything beyond yeah. that, it's getting tad drastic for that area. It can. And again, it, it, all of this is so dependent on the performance because now that the EQ things that we're talking about, we're assuming that we're actually playing in that range, which in fairness, for most people, pop music and rock music, you are, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's very rare that you would, might just have keyboard and guitar taking up all that low end and then the bass is doing something much higher in a higher register, right? It's not to say that it doesn't happen, but generally we need to think about arrangement and things and what is the most important part here? Do we need to kind of cut some of that out to make the bass sit better mm -hmm. in order for us to perhaps have it at the level of a track where it's prominent enough where we hear it and feel it, but it's not just sucking all the energy out of the mix, right? <laughs> the bass should never suck. It should no. should always be a big kick in the gut. Anyway. It's almost like it's a foundation for a lot of stuff. Right? Almost, <laughs> almost like it is. Now, yeah. getting a little bit above that area that I was just speaking about, where you're getting in closer to like 275, 330-ish range, mm -hmm. this now becomes the mud area. And it's not just the mud of the bass, but it could also be the mud of the kick drum too, which we've spoken about in previous episodes. Yeah. Here's where you need to start thinking about, well, where am I competing between this bass object and this kick object and which one really kind of gets the prominence? And for the bass, this can be problematic in here. Even though you've got fundamental notes that can be happening here, it can be very problematic when it's in conjunction with other instruments that are down in this area. Wise choices can be cutting, but with very narrow cue. So your Q range is going to be extremely high, and then you're going to cut to taste, so to speak. At yeah, least that's if, what I do. I don't know. Yeah. That. For me, if we're talking about that relationship between kick and bass in this range, mm -hmm. for me, the kick is going to lose because I will generally have that much lower. Mm -hmm. And to me in this range, if we're getting up to like, the 300, like you mentioned, like 300 or possibly even higher. As I've said before, for me, that the kick there, I'm just, I, I'm. There's nothing good in the kick for me here. <laughs> so, but there's got to be good in the bass, man. Yeah, what I'm saying is my method would probably be, unless I really have to, I would leave this range alone when okay. it comes to the bass, and then take out the kick. Now, if we're fighting with different instruments, that that might be a different point. But for me, it's. The, the way that, as we're going to go into later here, but the way the bass is recorded, obviously, is imperative for a, any of these moves to, to kind of make sure that it's, it's a good capture as possible. Sure. So, and not yeah. all of your bass lines are going to have mud in this area. I'm just saying that's the general area to watch out for. Yeah, it's that's a problematic mud... area, I think, for, for a lot of things. Right? Sure. Yeah. And with that, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. And we're back. Where are we moving on to now, Chris? Well, I think we've taken care of just about everything where the fundamentals and the low ends and the gut punches and the solar plexuses and <laughs> all those things. So how can we add clarity to our baseline if it needs it. If it's just not, let's say everything here is sounding pretty good, but we're not getting the presence, I guess, and the clarity of, the, of our baseline. So where are you looking for this? And what area are you looking for this, Joe? Well, I, I guess uh, I have to think about whether you're talking clarity of the overall sound or the articulation clarity of the bass itself on an That's a good bass. question. I'm thinking articulation. Right. For the articulation and for accents, I'm going to be looking somewhere in the range of 18 to 2400 
is mm-hmm. the general area. Now that can vary a little bit depending upon the base and the person picking with their fingers or a pick and what kind of pick and what kind of strings and all that kind of garbage. So it could go down a little bit lower, maybe even possibly as low as 1600 and maybe as high as 2,500, but it's in the general range of 18 to 24 ish. And in that range, you probably take a fairly narrow cue and a slight bump if you're trying to get a little bit more articulation out of your bass notes right there. But mm-hmm. you have to be relatively careful with this. Yeah. Because this is also where a whole lot of your vocal clarity lives as well. And even though they're in two entirely different ranges, so to speak, you don't want your bass trampling all over your vocal. <laughs> That's how I would look at it. And it can happen. So be very careful if you're trying to get your articulation on your bass at the same time you're trying to get some clarity out of your vocal as well. What about you? Yeah, I would echo all of that for the clarity sake of the bass. This is also one thing that, you know, you mentioned vocals and how much is going to be competing in that range, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where we have to make that judgment call. It's like, well, what is the most important part of the song are we you know let's say if we're listening to that bass just along with the drums for example just the rhythm section we're like oh that clarity sounds awesome right i can hear every note every articulation every little slide every pick it sounds amazing right yep but it could very well trample upon the vocal like if we're not careful so once the vocals and everything everything else comes in some of that clarity might have to be sacrificed or at least tamed somewhat. And again, I think it's one of those cases where listening in solo mode is not a good idea, right? We have to hear the the whole thing. But yeah, that's where the clarity lives. And one trick that I do a fair bit, and I know you do as well, but if I'm doing more of a, a rock track, instead of doing an EQ boost here, it might be a good to use a parallel sort of distorted bass track here. They can add some of that bite without having some drastic EQ, so you can kind of get a little bit of that into the track. Now that I will generally do, as I said, on, on a parallel and then low cut relatively high mm-hmm. on that parallel to kind of sure. do that. So that can add some of that as well, but that clarity can be dangerous or at least tricky in a bass track because it is so content dependent, right? Sure. What, what kind of track are we doing? Is it is it that aggressive rock track where we kind of want that to poke out there? Or is it more of a soulful kind of sting kind of a track, right? Where we just want a nice warm bass. And in that case, maybe we get really aggressive here and do a lot of cutting. I don't know. Questions we have to ask yourself, but but absolutely for that that clarity of articulation I will look in that range as well so let's mm-hmm. say that you're looking at just like you said like 1800 to 2400 that kind of vibe well and to riff upon your distortion thing yeah. you're saying in parallel mm-hmm. I have been in the room with a formerly famous bass player who is no longer on this earth and he's Famous for having played with a guitar player by the name of Ingve James Malmsteen. He always played distortion on his bass. It was literally part of his sound. It was not in parallel. It was on the sound itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like he tracked one and then duplicated it and added distortion to another. And I, I just think in my mind of how he would even explain this. He'd be like... Without distortion, you are playing like a pussy or something of that nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but that, I mean, in that genre, mm-hmm. you know, if you're dealing with like hard, hard rock. rock or metal, yeah. that's, that's the sound. It's kind of like, yeah, it's, you know, it's just as much as the aggression of like a distorted, a distorted guitar. Like that's the sound. When I'm describing that as a parallel would be to a track where it's not necessarily that. And it, you could... Also, and I've been guilty of this as well, it's really easy to overcook that also. (laughs) It is, yes. And I will say this. I have used parallel distortion on a bass in non-rock tracks, but it gets put in there very, very lightly, so it's almost not noticeable. 
But yeah. if you are intently listening in some way, shape, or form, you probably can figure it out. It does give a nice definition to the bass part that's happening. You just have to be careful of not over, as you say, not overcooking it. Yeah. There's, you know, we're going off where I'm going off on the tangent here a little bit off of this subject, but Logic's pedal board does a great job of this, actually, mm. when you're doing it because you can blend it. And I've been shocked at about how little you actually need to get in there. When If you're thinking about percentages of sort of wet, dry with sure. distortion for the bass, I mean... I'd be surprised if I would go over like 20% wet when it comes to that. So Yeah, it wouldn't be much. Yeah. What is the craziest bass manipulation that you have done in terms of EQ to get something right in the mix beyond the fader moves? Oh, I would have to think about that. But there was a time where I had, I still, I believe I still have it, but I had a, a sans amp. Uh -huh. Like the box, the sense of like yeah. the, the yellow and, and black one, right? <laughs> yep. And there was a time where I just cranked that sucker and DI'd the bass through that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even have it like a clean track because I know like, this is it. <laughs> but this is also during the time when I was really, really into like a lot of industrial stuff. Right, so that that was par for the course, but that hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed a fair bit, but I, it still holds a place in my heart, right? Sure. But but that technique, it was it was one of those things where initially you're you're kind of thinking about, well, this is wrong, right? You, you don't distort a bass, but you do, and it it really really worked. So that that's carried over for me. So a lot of times where, as opposed to reaching for an EQ to kind of do some some articulation. Right. I might use that trick as well. But as far as like any really extreme stuff, I don't know. I remember there's an album I, I worked on for an artist where we did we did three bass tracks. There was one straight DI, there was one amped, and then there was one sort of like DI out from the head of the amp as well, mm. which was sort of like going through the amp section. Right. And all in the name of, let's capture as many options as possible, right? I think in the end, if at all, but I think maybe we used two of them. And I think that it was the generally the amped cab that ended up losing out because it could get so woolly and the articulation just got lost in that because it was like, Wah! you know, <laughs> and it's like, oh, that maybe we, we overdid that a little bit. But at least then you have the DI and stuff so you can do that. Sure. But I'm not sure if that's very extreme or anything. But what about you? What, what have you, have you done anything like sacrilegious yes. EQ-wise? To, yes, to I bass? have. Okay, confess, my son. <laughs> <laughs> I have taken a bass track. I have duplicated it. On one pass of the track, I would take a high pass filter and really high pass it out, right? Mm -hmm. So that I'm getting mostly just the upper end, like the 2K range and above to get the oh, wow. articulation out of it. On the other version of the same track, I would do a low pass filter and probably low pass it as low as like 250. So you're cutting out like a whole lot of the mids. It's almost like using the... Even tied plug in fission, but doing right. it with two tracks and just two EQs. And literally just going for the low end girth and the high end clarity uh -huh. and erasing everything in the middle. All the meat in the middle. All had the to meat go. in the middle had to go. And what's interesting about it is the rest of the track supported that and it worked. Yeah. Because you huh. got the feeling of what the bass was doing because you still have got the articulation of the actual playing. And then you've got the low end gut of the bottom. And then the rest of the mids and the meat and everything else is taken up by the rest of the instrumentation in the track. Now, gran granted, it's a very dense track, but it worked. Yeah, I was going to say, what ungodly amount of instrumentation had to take place to, <laughs> to be able to carry lots that of giant guitars hole. and everything else, you know, there's a lot of stuff. So, yeah. And it worked. Well, if it works, it works, right? It's when we're very talking about normal, but it worked. Yeah. Well, those are the kids. It's like the, the times when you said that you, you sang through a, a piezo mm -hmm. microphone, right? <laughs> so, if it calls for it, it, it 
you know, ex- experimentation is key here, right? And it might not be something that you do on every track, but right, not something um, I would do on every track for sure. Right. Yeah. No, I'm just going to create a giant hole here for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Give you um, the impression that the bass is there, but it's not. Yeah. Exactly. It. Well, as as Nigel Tufnell said, you know, it's a, it's a small line between stupid and clever. Right? <laughs> so, um, what about high end though? Do you deal with high end really on the bass here, or? It's rare that the bass is going to get anything beyond the clarity area and Mm. possible distortion unless the track is really calling for the bass to sound like it's sitting in some kind of room and you need to hear the air of the room i might eq the air of some weird reason of putting a reverb on a bass which doesn't happen often but it can happen it's not something that's common for me what about you i tend to get rid of it if I can. I mm-hmm. mean, if you have a dense enough track, and this is something I've noticed like Chris Lord Algae do a lot of times because he's certainly not afraid of, of extreme EQ moves. And he's a fan of this. And I've tried it before where he's just like, yeah, high shelf on the bass, yeah, crank it type of thing, right? Just mm-hmm. to have a certain sound in a dense rock mix or whatever. And it can work sometimes, but to me, it, I get mixed results with that. And I think I find that scooping things out here or just leaving them alone is probably better for me. Right. Yeah. But there's not a whole lot. It's kind of like what we talked about, whether it's electric guitars and stuff. Once you get above like 8K or lower, probably 6K, right? Is there anything really worth there but just like fizziness? And, and unless you're doing like a they say you're doing like a fingerstyle jazz track, right? Where you want that instrument to really breathe and it's a trio or whatever. You might keep that in there. Yeah, no, high. I'm not a big fan of high end on bass, but that's just me. I could be wrong. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, no, I, I think, but all in all, but when we're talking about EQing bass, I think I generally do less EQing on a bass. I think overall, than on a lot of other stuff. Let's say certainly when it comes to drums, Mm -hmm. right? But that's not bass. Get off it. No, it's not. But I'm just saying uh, so that my my sort of philosophy as a whole when it comes to EQing bass is generally more subtle, I would say. I certainly take into consideration the parts that we're, we're dealing with here. But as always, like if we're having to do too much EQ moves or too drastic EQ moves here, it's probably maybe time for a re-record, maybe? Maybe. That's, yeah. My high and low pass filter example is, it wouldn't have taken a re-record, but it's one of those super extreme examples that is very rare to ever happen. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Sure, but but that's also clearly more towards the experimental scale and just making sure that it works as opposed to the norm, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Sometimes you, you do that and it's like, but let's say that that move hadn't worked for you. Then it would have been time for retooling. For yeah, exactly. But paying attention to the part, the way it is, what it is, what kind of track it is, and use it judiciously or not, but just make it work. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Yeah. True words were never spoken. Make it work. There you go. All yeah. right. And with that, we're going to move on to our Friday Finds. Chris, what have you got for us today? I'm fairly certain that I have mentioned this piece of software before. But Shame on you. <laughs> yes. But it really, really came, I don't want to say to my rescue this week, but as I said, I had a Relatively busy couple of weeks here recording guitars for certain clients. And it was one of those things where I used it on this track and I could just get the results I wanted really, really quickly. And it sounded really, really good. There was a fair bit of breadth to the sound. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just like one thing. It was I needed to do this and I needed to do that and I needed to do another thing sound-wise. And... It just came through, man. It was Great. like, okay. You yeah. haven't so, mentioned what it is. 
Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I should probably do that, shouldn't I? Yes. Uh, Neural DSP, the Soldano 100 plugin. All right, then. I got so excited, I forgot to mention it. Yeah. No, that, that, that really, you know, it's just a DI guitar going in and, yeah, it, it pull a few knobs, that thing smokes. Uh, it's great. I know I, I mentioned too many guitar amp sims on, on this podcast, but that that's one. Maybe it's because I, I have a Soldano that <laughs> I, I really like Soldano stuff. Again, that's my Friday find for this week. And you, sir, I believe you're going to go in a different direction than I am. Very different. I'm going yeah. with the Orchestral Tools Habitat. Ooh. Yes. I'm unfamiliar. I have been unfamiliar with this as well until I came across it. And I was like, holy cow, I think I need something like this, especially with an upcoming film that I'm supposed to be working with. The idea of the orchestral tools habitat is that you can link synths and acoustic orchestral instruments in very different ways. It's like a great resource for those who are really into pads and creative textures. Mm -mm. It is the culmination of a partnership as well. And it's technically just called habitat, but it's a partnership between orchestral tools and polymath. Okay. Uh, I've never heard Let's of either of these companies, but it seems like a really cool situation that they're throwing out into the world that you can do some pretty wild stuff with these synths that they've created along with acoustic orchestral samples to go with it. That's my pick for this week. Awesome. Yes. While we have your attention, we ask that you go to Inside the Recording Studio and sign up for our mailing list. Doing so will get you weekly reminders about the Tuesday tips, when they come out, and we'll make sure that you don't miss any future episodes of the podcast. Send us an email at goldstar, G-O-L-D-S-T-A-R, at insidetherecordingstudio.com with the word BASE. And you'll get something cool back in your inbox if you have a topic or a suggestion for Chris and I to explain in a future episode, contact us at the contact page and we'll put it into consideration for a future episode. In addition to this and all of that that I've just mentioned, if you like stuff and getting it for free, you might want to check out another page on our website called the giveaway page because we do run giveaways from time to time. And with that, I'll say see you next week. Thanks for listening, people. Talk to you later, Gary.